Welcome to the Well Played VHS podcast, Well Played's film and television podcast. I'm Zach Jackson and joining me is Adam Ryan. Hello, I'm here. And Nathan Hennessy. Been a minute. So excited to be back on one of these, eh, boys? That's it. The video hangouts are in session, boys. We are here to chat A Quiet Place Day 1. Uh, we had the pleasure of seeing it thanks to Paramount Pictures, so big shout-outs to uh, to those guys for providing a couple of passes for us. But, uh, yeah, let's let's get stuck straight into it. No time for preamble on the VHS. You you, you want the preamble, you got to stick around for the DLC. All right. Adam. Nice. Hello. Let's start with you. Give me a very, very quick breakdown of your thoughts on A Quiet Place. 30 seconds or I, less. I really enjoyed it. I thought it expanded on what we've seen from the first two movies enough where it kept me interested, like the little nuggets that it kind of, of, of world building that it gave. Um, I thought the performances of the lead two characters was pretty solid. Obviously a lot of it is silent. So it was very heavily relied on kind of just bodily movements. Um, but there was, you know, the little bits of dialogue here and there, but yeah, ultimately really enjoyed it. I think thought the setting was cool, even though, you know, action movies, New York, it's kind of a trope at this point. Um, it's a little bit of a spin on that and I enjoyed it. Yeah. I had a really, really good time. Nice good stuff. Nathan, what'd you, what do you think? You can be the, uh, the meat and the sandwich. Yeah. I've got to be careful here because the reality is it, I thought the film was fine. Like. My my overall went leaving the theater was it's fine so generally on the side of positive, but I imagine that Zach and I are probably going to bring to the service here a fair few criticisms. No spoilers there for Zach, but I I don't know. I got issues with this. It's definitely my least favorite of the trilogy, and I disagree with Adam. I didn't it didn't expand the world building in an interesting way for me. I when when April and I left the theater, we thought. Hmm, like what? What was the deal with that film? Like it, it, it surprised us in that it seemed like an obvious thing to a prequel said in day one, um, but it 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 had a wishy washy relationship to the rules of the first two films that kind of left us a little bit, I don't know, um, lukewarm by the finale. So I imagine we're gonna split a few hairs here, even though mm. just as I said, generally positive, mm. and then I'm gonna rag on it a little bit. <laughs> All right, before I get into that, one thing I meant to say off the top of the thing, a little bit of housekeeping there, but this is going to be a spoiler cast. So we will be talking will be a full-blown movie details. So if you haven't seen it and you are, you know, wanting to see it, probably don't listen further than now. Go and check out the film and then come back and hit resume on this bad boy. But I think Nathan might be in the same boat as Adam. In Are you referring to my response in our Slack channel? I absolutely am, yes. Yeah. So my impression okay. was that Zach was similarly lukewarm, but he might surprise no. me here. That, that's... No, because oh. Adam, Adam in the Slack, so in the Slack, Adam was like thumbs up or thumbs down. So I sent the picture of Phoenix with the thumb in the middle being like, I ain't going to tell you. Hey, you know what? This, this, that, that, that's like, that, that is now the modern mid. Oh, is it? Okay, well, sorry, you know. It's a, that's a mid, mate. That's a mid. I'm not, that's a I'm mid not down with the, uh, <laughs> the modern lingo. I'm only down with the modern fashion, mate. But um, All right. I, I liked it. I liked it. I don't think it was my favourite film in the franchise uh, or series, I should say. Um, but I liked it. I Yeah, I th there are some... I think I agree with Nathan a bit there. I don't think it quite expanded on the law that much. Like, I don't feel like I learned anything new. No, that's um, how I felt leaving it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But again, like I, I still quite enjoyed it, but we'll, 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 we'll dive into it in a moment, but where do we, before we get stuck into it, just very, very quickly, where do we sit on this franchise? So personally, um, I mean, you, you both, you probably know that I love my apocalyptic shit like this. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, neither like the last, this is probably one of my favorite apocalypse franchises, like, you know, outside cool. of like the last of us. So like, you know, I do really, really, really like this universe and this idea. Um, so yeah, I'm always keen to. Interesting. To you mentioned the last of us cause that came to mind a fair bit. A little mm. bit. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, how about you two? 
I I really enjoy the the premise because I think a lot of post apocalyptic scenarios kind of have you know general outbreak or whatever if we're talking like zombies for instance but then you just kind of set up your own little base camp and you continue on life as it was just kind of in a stripped back kind of camping sense whereas the premise of these films it fundamentally changes the way that we live as humans like we can no longer use our voice or be loud or whatever so you the way you live is fundamentally changed. And I think that's uh, an interesting little wrinkle on the the post-apocalyptic kind of setting. Um, I definitely probably enjoyed the first one the most because it's kind of lower stakes and it's kind of the most intimate story, whereas obviously this one is a lot larger in scale. Um, But yeah, overall, I'm I'm a a big fan of the, the series. I think it's very, very cool. So that leaves myself, and um, <clears throat> similar to you, gentlemen, I think the first one was uh, a, a real uh, breath of fresh air, and what really drew me to it was it, it provided a bit more of a kind of a pastoral setting or theme to a horror film. What do I mean by that? It stripped, it's, it's a modern setting that strips back all the mod cons and imagines again humans once again sort of entering the food chain but as you say living a life that's vastly different vastly and and it being silent and of course that that silence then contributes to so many of the rules of the world building for for that series that were interestingly expanded upon in the sequel and then if we go to day one we've got to bring that right back and go the audience knows what the rules are but the cast doesn't and Mm. uh that definitely suspended some of the suspense for me when I thought, okay, so we know what's happening. The characters just haven't caught up to us yet. And that's definitely a a big chunk of the movie, which admittedly by the end, guys, I I did doze off there uh, 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 towards the end because I didn't feel like there was enough uh, keeping me engaged. Mm. All right, cool. So, Nathan, seeing as you're the the big lover of this film and you love the... uh, you got the best pronunciation of the uh, the cast here. What, tell us what the uh, the outline uh, synopsis is on this one. Well, we begin with our protagonist, Sam, played by star Peter Nyong'o, who uh, don't know she has got herself a Scream Queen status, but she's certainly uh, been in a good bunch of horror films by now. So it's really cool to see her in this. Uh, she's a, she's an actress that does very well with dialogue, and so then asking her to not say a whole lot in this film was something that Kalusha was quite fine with. Very interestingly, our character of Sam actually starts off in hospice, which sets an interesting precedent for a horror film because right at the outset, the story is telling us this character's disposable. The implication being that with this character in hospice, and we're told this quite early on as well, they're they're terminally ill. They're facing cancer. They're not going to survive their illness. They're probably not going to survive this film. And they don't. And there's thoughts on that we'll expand later on. But that sets us up for the outset. We've got a disposable character on the precipice of the alien invasion hitting uh, New York. And do we have a functional name for these aliens at this point? I I can't remember if the series has defined them with any kind of label. Is Is that actually it? Death Angels? I, I don't know if that's exactly what, like, an in-universe name, but I know that that's the name that this kind of stuck to them. That's sick. Yeah, let's go with that. Death Angels, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and, and then and then the, the hospice, they do a little trip into the city because they're, ba- they're it's based in New York, but they're just based outside of the city, so they do a little, they do a little town trip. And uh, in, in their little town trip, they go see a marionette play, and it's all nice, and they're just trying to get a little bit of peace in their lives before they dearly depart. But, of course... After the marionette play, when we're all sort of getting ready to go back home to our hospice and face out our dying days, death angels appear. New York gets grounded by an invasion and shit turns sour. That's the synopsis as we are looking. Yeah. That's it. So do we so this was this is in New York. Can you remember where the first two films are set? Or at least the first one? Like Ooh, where... I can't recall the specific locale, no. Yeah. I'll have no, a no. I'll have a look. No, because they're not buoyed um, by any kind of landmark. As I said, it's very pastoral. It's just back to basics. We've gone rural because rural's quiet. And and it worked. I love the way it built its rules mm. in the first two films. In 
in the state of New York. So it's just in the, oh. the countryside of New York. Okay. Right. Okay. So it's the same. Okay. I, I didn't, I actually didn't realize that. There is one uh, little wonderful point at, at the start of the film that we get a little text scroll that tells us about the, what, what New York is like for, for the, the audibly inclined. And that is, it is oh. a very noisy city, the perfect place for an outbreak of an apocalyptic scale where sound means you'll end. So get the noisiest motherfucking city and mm. start lopping off people one by one. That's a great, you know, that, that kind of works as a synopsis. So New York. 90 decibels was the limit, I think it said. 90. Yeah, right. I do, I do like that they likened it to a constant scream. I thought that yeah. was a, a nice little touch. It Very gives, evocative. Gives, yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly sets the tone. And they do set the tone well at the start, absolutely. Yeah, it's a pretty, I mean, it all, it's, it's quite slow, but then it hits pretty fast, if that makes sense. Um, yes, yeah. it does. It takes, yeah. takes a little while to get going, but when it gets going, when we hit the invasion, which you cannot miss, it's quite the set piece, then the film definitely kicks up a gear. That's it. That's it. And then we see our uh, our main character, Sam, and, you know, it's all... It's all very, and But she's got... Comfy she's also a got, cat. Correct, yeah. She's also got her cat, which... Sure. Um, Heaviest plot right. armor on that animal. <laughs> <laughs> they, that that poor cat. Kudos to that cat. Great, great little actor. Heavy Excellent lifter actor. though. Fuck an oath. They spent that cat gets quite a bit of screen time. How, mm. how you guys feel about that though? Like that that cat is portrayed as a hero more than anyone else in the film. I'd argue. Well, the, well there's just there, there's one scene later in the towards the end of the film where um, the other guy, Eric. Uh, Eric, yep. Joseph, Joseph, Joseph Quinn, Quinn from Stranger Things, which I actually didn't. I, I forgot. Just... I was like, when I was looking at uh, doing the thing, the the run sheet for this, and I looked up the cast. I was because I was like, I know I know him from somewhere, but I, I just can't put my finger on it. And I saw mm. that he was in um, in Stranger Things. Anyway, but yeah, there, there's that scene where he kind of crawls into the the nest, if you want to call it that, or the the yep. feeding grounds. And I was like, mate, this cat, how how can it just Mosey on in, go up a couple of there, steps. Cat's impervious. This, yeah. yeah. There was all, almost like a mystical element to the cat at one, and like particularly when Joseph Quinn's character was introduced. Um, he, How he's introduced is he kind of comes up from the, the subway system, which has been flooded, and he's, you know, gasping for air. It's a and very odd intro. It is, yeah. <laughs> um, pops up. How you doing? But he takes in a few breaths of air and then he sees the cat, who's named Frodo, by the way, fantastic okay. name. Um, and it sort of has a calming presence on him. But then he decides to follow the cat, which is where he runs into Sam. And the cat seems to, I mean, that the, talking plainly, the cat's kind of the driving force of the entire film. Like a lot I'm of it go is... go one step further and say the cat is a deus ex mark, you know, that cat is... Yeah, <laughs> like it, it does well, seem what... to have like a very pivotal role to play. So I don't, I, I mean, I don't know if that was maybe what they were aiming for, or it was just kind of like a device that they kind of maybe leaned on a little bit too heavily, but yeah, I don't know. I definitely saw it in Eric's introduction that it had some sort of mythical property in, on, in, in the world. I don't I mean, think the cat is a God by any stretch of the imagination, but that's yeah. But in terms of the, 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 uh, the ability for that cat to amend what could be plot holes? That's a perfect example that you've given. So uh, about maybe a bit, bit over a third, like almost halfway through the film. So we're getting mm. a little bit ahead. Invasion has happened. Bedlam is occurring. Uh, Sam's trying to get her bearings and, and trying to figure out the rules. So our characters are kind of, they don't have explicit conversations as much as such about we've got to be silent, but rather uh, actually an important point. Uh, Sam's knocked out during the invasion comes to, in the marionette theatres, I believe. Yeah. And uh, right away is, is told, you know, don't say a word. So right immediately, uh, that and that, this is a good point, we don't need to go over the rules we've already learnt as audience before. So we're able to catch this character up quite quickly, which was nice. Um, but, but then, of course, we've got to have, as we know from the marketing, we've got to have her character meet up with uh, uh, Eric's, right? 
just have the cat bring them together. It's New York. Yeah. Mm. Don't don't matter about how big the blocks are and what the disparity of distance is. Just get the cat to sort that out. If there ever there's kind of plot hole or something a little bit whirly, just get the cat, cat. sorted out. Yeah. So yeah, so so right at the start, kind of when when Sam does wake up in the theater, she has a conversation with a character called Henry, which is who is played by, and I've already forgotten now. <laughs> when we listen to Jamon Hunsu, 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 and uh, yeah, you know, um, and her uh, God, like not nurse, but what's the what's the I guess I guess he yeah, is a nurse. A, a, it's a absolutely nurse. a nurse. Yeah, yeah. But he's he, certainly he, but, the hospice. Yeah, but he's more like a um uh not not more than that, but you know, he he's obviously a he's a carer. I mean I know like a nurse is but you know, there's there, there's more of a relationship there that, that seems more than just he's just a nurse, right? You know. He he's obviously uh, got a, a special bond with these people. And yeah, he there's a scene where basically she says that she's going to get pizza from this particular pizza joint in Harlem. And, um, you know, that, that, that's kind of the, the, the other, ending. yeah, you know, that's kind of the, um, the story that we kind of focus on is, is that we, we follow the journey of Sam going to find this, this pizza joint and Eric kind of just tags along with her. Um, I did, I did like, did I like it? I was surprised at how quickly they adapted or how, you know, that they learnt the rules of, of this world. Cause there, there's a scene where Eric and Sam are at her apartment. Right. And then they kind of like waiting for the lightning to go. And then it's like thunder. And then she's like, kick the door down. It's just like, I found, I found it all very quick, you know, and then there's that scene like under the, under the, um, the walkway where like there's, there's, there's rain. And stuff like well, even that. Even under the fountain when she encounters children quite early yeah. on. So that yeah. probably counters some... I think I might have said earlier that they didn't pick up the rules fast enough. I, I think that's flat out wrong. I don't think that's probably the issue. So they probably... Maybe the issue is they pick up the rules maybe a little bit too quick. I definitely... I thought the, the film had... It's in, an interesting relationship with the rules, a.k.a. being very quiet in terms of... Hmm. If, as a quick aside, I adore in again the pastoral previous films. They're quite comfortable in laying like sand out on walkways and stuff. And there's a lot of care given to how they treat the world, how they walk upon it, how they interact with it. That's not really a factor. And of course, it's an urban crawl in in New York City. So I don't know. I yeah. I, I was hoping for a little bit more meticulousness. I I I, I I'm a we, I, I'm a sicko for the details. Um, I think what the yeah. first two films had in their favor is that they were obviously set well into this um, yeah. universe. So at mm. that point in time, when we were introduced to the first film, you know, they'd already learnt the rules. So we kind of, um, here they are meant to be learning, but I just, I found, I found it all very, very quick. Yeah. I, I think the, the main way that they learnt the rules is they were literally told by like helicopters were going overhead and the, I don't know, army, whoever it was, was literally blasting out being like, make sure you be quiet now because it seems like they're attracted to noise. As we made Um, lots of noise. And that was fine, yeah. Yeah, like that part was good. Like that made sense, but it's Mm. more that the noise, the safe spaces that they can make noise. It's like what, like like, how how How, did they learn that nuance so quick? Yeah, yeah. Mm, I get you. I, I, I picked that up immediately as well. I was like, oh, okay. So they figured out that rain is a suppressing factor. Is yeah. it? Those rules are a little bit wishy-washy in terms of ambience, right? Now mm. we're really getting in the sticks. But the anyway. way the film kind of treats ambient noise is a little bit wishy-washy in terms of the drama. And, and, and I'm, yeah. as again, splitting hairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm nitpicking for the sake of nitpicking here, but I, I did, I did, I was like... Sure. Yeah, you have to. I think with this film, it is asking for you to suspend that element of disbelief a little more than the Mm. previous two, perhaps. But I think, I think, I think when we get to that scene where they when they are in the apartment, I think that's for me when the film definitely picks up. Um, Mm -hmm. um, And I, I don't know if that's where you kind of felt not not like exactly like last but that's where that kind of similar relationship between you know two two people kind of. Um, was established 
and you 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 can kind of get that that Sam was a bit like Joel in the sense that she really didn't want Eric to kind of tag along, and he was like, you know, I'd just just I'd rather be back in wherever it was, or you know, you know, going off on my own. Um, but you know, but no, I actually found their their chemistry pretty good um, through their journey. You know, I I did quite like. Um, I can't, I'm trying to remember the scene. There's a scene. It's before the, I think, before the flood in the when they're under the water. Mm-hmm. No, sorry, sorry, no, 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 sorry, it's after that. Sorry, it's the scene in the jazz club. Sorry, um, when they're pretending to do do like the magic show. I, I did, I do, I do really quite quite like that that scene. I thought, I thought that was at... very that was a nice moment. Yeah, there are a couple of nice little poignant moments between the two characters. There's um, while they're in the apartment and they're they're screaming during the the lightning storm is kind of just kind of a off the cuff moment. But then the conversation they have afterwards about her being a poet and she kind of gives like surface level details about why she wants to go to the pizza place and who her dad was. I thought just the the quiet little moments did use them quite effectively to, yeah, build the relationship that they have with each other. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably strongly agree with that because without those, and again, there, there's there's only a few scenes of, of like dialogue where free talking, uh, and it's allowed and it's, it's fine. Without that, we wouldn't really have any reason to care about these mm. two as companions because they really are just thrown together by a circumstance, a circumstance named Frodo. Oh, there you go. They've got no reason, really. Like, uh, Sam, as we know, she's got no real concern for her survival. So for her to babysit or, or or share a survival element with another person doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So at least we're afforded a couple of moments of intimacy to go, okay, human nature would demand that companionship during a time as tumultuous like this would make perfect sense. And you can just relate to this on a human level and leave it at that. They don't spend too much time on dialogue, and I really appreciate that. I do also yeah. enjoy that Eric's character, like he's from the outset shown to be in like very fearful. Like he, he isn't one of, up. yeah. Like he isn't like Sam's character who she kind of takes to it like a duck to water. And she just kind of, you know, I'm going to go to Harlem. I'm going to get a piece of pizza. I don't really give a fuck what happens along the way. And instead of doing that awful trope where it's, you know, he has a heroic moment and then all of a sudden his fears disappear right up until mm. the dying moments of the film. He is petrified and like he needs help the entire time. So I was, I was kind of waiting for that other shoe to drop and for him to get kind of some hero moment. And his hero moment came in the quieter moments, like in the jazz club, his hero moments were on a more personal level and less on a save the day level. And I, yeah, I really appreciated that. Yeah, it kind of feels like we've got two two half characters in a way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Eric, and together we kind of get the full horror character element between yeah. the two of them, and that's nice. I like, and you're right; it doesn't it bucks trend, it bucks tropes, and that's that might be my favorite thing of this film, actually. Yeah. Mm. All right. What do we think of the actual scenes with the uh, the Death Angels? Um, yeah, there was that one scene where I didn't quite understand why. So you know that that there's that scene where they all flood into the streets. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, yep. Interesting scene that, but yes. Yeah, so a little context on that: there is a scene where basically the invasion has occurred, and the survivors, after the first however many hours, are kind of spread out. You know, into buildings, etc. There is a moment in the film where everyone kind of congregates onto the streets, so sort of coming yeah, together, a shared realization. The army comes through, and they're like, "You must get to the sea to get on you these." Got to get to the docks. Yeah. yeah so yeah. everyone's just, well, fuck it. We're all just going to congregate now. I, where Nathan, you said that you kind of had some issues with some of the finer details of the rules of the film. Mm. I think this was my moment where I kind of it gave me the shits because they had they had clearly demonstrated that they had been told the rules or they had it. They clearly had an understanding. No one was having light conversation about the weather while walking. They were all being silent, but they were walking like thousands deep 
Yeah, like there, there was a there was a march, and you're gonna hear a march, right? Yeah, like <laughs> regardless of how quietly you're walking, that is thousands of people all walking at once. So I did find that a little bit irritating. What I did enjoy was when the penny dropped and the monsters do attack. Um, it's shown like there's one that's kind of like blended into the the wall of a building, and it just kind of shoots out of nowhere, and then shit just like it clicks and everything, you know, shit hits the fan. I thought that was really cool. The setup I wasn't so big on. I'm not, I wasn't a big fan of everyone's following the rules apart from these thousands of people that are all marching at once. Yeah. I'm with you. I allowed it because it gave the film one of its few big spectacle moments and, and a film set yeah, York during an apocalypse, mm. kind of expecting more set piece moments, more, more big moments of devastation a lot of it happens off screen. That might sound like a criticism, and it is a little bit, but one thing this film does well, that the previous ones do as well, it, uh, it do well as well, is the audio design. So what we don't see, we yeah. do hear, and it is quite horrifying in terms mm. of the, the march of the Death Angels overhead when we hear our characters in buildings or and they're sort of going over yeah. rooftops or through the streets. is quite, tr- quite a tremendous bit of audio design that we're treated to. So what we don't see, we definitely hear, and that's neat. Mm. Well, even that one in that scene that we that I mentioned earlier, where Eric goes into that you know the feeding farm, um, you know, into the nest, you know that's that's quite a visceral audio experience almost. Like, um, and then I think yeah. there's that moment where uh, one of the Death Angels can kind of sense or he or the, they it hears something and um, gets right up into Eric's kind of grill there, and he's got his teeth going, he's gnashing away. Awful. And, they're awful to look at. I watched it with Key, and she can't deal with when their head opens up and it exposes all of the membrane stuff. She was like, what's it look like? What's it look like as she's turning her head? So that was fun to have to explain something that was directly in front of her. Um, I think my favourite moment with the Death Angels is when just before they go into the subway and do the whole underwater bit where they've made noise and they're trying to escape and there's that one moment where the camera pans up and you see them bucketing down the side of a building yeah. i thought that was a really really cool visual and seeing like one smash through the 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 skylight like yeah very very cool i liked that a lot treated to a few of them but for some reason by the by the time the credits had rolled i had a weird feeling that i expected more the death angels and seeing them sort of cause chaos through the city but no 90 percent of our attention is set on sam and by extension the proto and eric yeah. and i don't know that wasn't what i expected i'm okay with it but mm. i was expecting a little bit more exposure to the chaos yeah i'm kind of glad sorry to jump in zach i'm kind of glad yeah. that we like the when i said the world building that we got i kind of meant like the you see them eating the whatever weird fungus it was and you can see bodies in the background looks like maybe human bodies are absorbed into it and then they feed on it or whatever you kind of drip fed a few more details in each film about them um Mm. i don't want to know everything about them i i like that there's mystery around it but i do like that there's just little hints about their origins and what they do and how they interact with the world so just just little bits and pieces what do you make of that, if, if we're actually on that point? So about three quarters through the film, Eric is uh, finds himself in what appears to be like a kind of terraformed location. It's like, it's inside a building, isn't it? Is it inside mm. a building? Like a ruined it's, building, yeah. It's yeah. inside a ruined building, and you've got this yeah. uh, environment and atmosphere that kind of looks kind of terramorphed. It's very alien. And in this is these kind of like egg-like sacks, that are then uh, they're, they're kind of nibbled at by Frodo for some fucking reason. What, who knows? Whatever. Cat's gonna cat. Uh, cat's gonna cat. Yeah, I've I initially assumed that it was like it must be some kind of dead human body. And you know how like cats will apparently gnaw it like dead humans or some shit. Uh, and then so I, I didn't really fully understand that. But then of course we see the Death Angels also splitting these sacks apart and having a feast. Is this their subsistence? Is this? how they sustain themselves on the planet. I didn't really know what to, what information to glean from this scene. What did you take? 
Well, my it's kind of similar to the the rules of this world. I thought it was very quick. Like that, like that, that that whole area has been set up very fast. Like they've been here. What it appears to be what maybe thirty six hours, maybe twenty four. It's implied that it's yeah, a couple of days most, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that is a that's happened quickly. They get to terraform it real fast. If that's yeah. what was occurring. They're efficient. <laughs> from what from what I kind of understood from it, it where it. The, the the area around it looked like a crash site because they at the start of the film you see them um they they more or less appear as with asteroids Meteors. right mm. yeah exactly so i don't know i took it as where they landed is where all their i don't know you, you got it it was probably a long fucking flight man they came from some other planet you got to pack snacks or at least Qantas maybe gave them a hot towel and some mm. nuts on the way um, and then going forward, I suppose maybe they need humans to cultivate their food source or something. But that's what I mean. I love that we don't know. It's given just a very quick little, hey, here's them eating. You hear them give out like a, a friendlier echolocation sort of noise to kind of, you know, get the homies over to have a, have a couple of beers and some, you know, bar nuts. But then you're left to speculate and have these conversations. I like that. I like okay. that you're not just outwardly told. What do you think of this of that scene? That how, how like so that scene's obviously designed to build a lot of tension with with Eric. And then once they once he or you know or they that kind of moment passes, it's just like fade to black almost. And then he's back in the um in the room with with Sam or the church. I think I, I think it was. I get what you mean. It doesn't have at least I didn't think it had an impact on the characters or the rest of the film. It's a handy tidbit for the audience, mm. but could it have been a deleted scene and it wouldn't have actually impacted the the narrative and what we knew of the characters? Yeah, probably. Yeah. It, it probably, yeah, it's, 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 it probably wasn't an impactful inclusion, but it's, it's just, I just found it very strange that he's in this, this, this hive, this area where there's a lot of these things and it's just, Oh yeah, no, he's just back in the thing, like with the medicine, all good. and the and the cat's there. It's all good. Anyway. Yeah, I think maybe the same thing could have been achieved if he just saw that shit happening from a distance, and it was like a they're on their way somewhere, and they kind of, you know, spy them from a distance doing their gross eating habits. Because yeah, it kind of didn't fit with his scared of everything character, but you know, it was a quick moment. Mm. Which is going to allow me to throw a quick criticism into the mix and say, I don't really think this film had much in the way of original scares, or at least it really had to kind of push for them and confect them. It wasn't a film that I left thinking, wow, that really shivered my timbers. Not like not like some of the scares in the first two. It felt like it was repeating scares from the first two. What do I mean by that? Getting up close, like face to face with them, and, yeah. and they're doing the whole, we got to hold our breath. I've seen that a few times in this series, mm. so that's been played. It felt like, I mean, so we kind of were maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes in and Anna goes, what's this film rated? And I was like, oh, fuck, fuck if I know, MA maybe. And I looked at the ticket and it's M. And I think that that sums up a lot of that. Like it's it's a, safe is probably the wrong word, but it's, you know, it's, it's, well, safe it's is M. probably, yeah, yeah. Like it's an M15 sci-fi thriller if you want to maybe go there i don't think it goes yep. goes in yep. goes into the horror territory much at I'd all agree. i think Hang on. yeah yeah i think the Compared only to the previous two mm. the only scene is maybe that underwater scene uh or that scene where they're in the tunnel if anything because mm. they're in such a tight confined space but apart from that yeah, um, it's an apocalypse thriller isn't it mm. yeah, yeah. Mm. all right so we'll quickly jump to the end and that's where we see, uh, so they do go to this like jazz club where Sam's dad uh, used to play the piano and then um, Eric walks off and... This must have been where yeah. I fell asleep because I don't recall this, but you're going. Right. So Eric Eric walks <laughs> off and finds a, a pizza place that's obviously still got some pizza still there. This is where so I he, woke up. Yeah. Okay. He brings it back and um, also, well, did you see the magic show? Because that happened... I'm pretty that sure that's before right. the pizza or after the pizza. That was after the pizza, the, after the pizza. little magic show. Um, okay. Yeah. So they have yeah. So they have this little bonding moment, and then um, yeah, then they decide to 
I think they, you know, sorry, I think they go up onto the, not to the roof, but to like a balcony or whatever, or a stairway or whatever it might be. And, and they see this and there's like a one boat leaving or something, which I guess implies it's one of the last boats or if not the last boat out mm. of uh, New York. And then, yeah, uh, we basically see Sam sacrifice herself and then Eric almost fuck it um, and then runs off with the cat. Um, yeah, so, so we come face to face with Sam's lack of concern for her safety because remember at the start of the film, we're told this is a character with, with a terminal illness. They've got a, they've got a use by date, right? So of course, throughout most of the film, we're kind of expecting that this is a disposable character, but of course this is the marketed main lead. We're probably going to see them till the end. We do before they manage to wipe themselves out off screen. <laughs> Yeah, so we don't quite see what happens that. like right at the very end. But so it's, essentially, Sam goes and smashes a bunch of car windows. Uh, Eric grabs the cat and to sprints to cause and distraction. and yeah. yeah to cause distraction, so Eric can kind of jump, uh, jump, Make run, the run free, and then jumps into the water with the cat. Which I found like, why is the cat not freaking out? But anyway, um, oh, I, I told you that cat is the most impeccable actor. Because... He's a service cat, so and he he's trying goes to. completely. Frodo. Um, so, uh, yeah, that'd be traumatic. Yes. So, jumps into the water and then, you know, reaches the boat. And who's on our boat? Big old Henry Digimon. It is, Dij- it is Digimon. worth noting that he is in the second film. He's, yes. he's like a little cheeky Easter egg. Yes. Oh, he well, is. that completely flew over my head. Nice. I forgot. I started watching the second one when I was in Queensland, but I didn't get all the way through it. But um, when I was looking at it, I saw that he was in the, n- the number two. So um, It's a nice detail. I, I, I miss that. And that's kind of, that, that makes me smile. Like that's a great little detail to put that in. I didn't mm. think that the film had any real carryover qualities to the others, um, but it's nice to see that we've got a character that, that survives in, in some yeah. substantial fashion. So then, once we get that, we, um, we we basically get Sam. Then walks into the street with uh, Sam's job's done. She's created her distraction, yeah. and but she somehow yeah, survived she... it. Uh, yeah. the distraction. She's amazing. Yeah, she she set off every car alarm down by the docks and put herself front and center and walked away. Happy days. Can't be touched, mate. And then uh, we get yeah. So then she's got the uh, got got the iPod Nano. I think it is. Yep, or something like that, and um, whacked it into a dock. Whacked into Puts a dock. Puts it in a boombox, baby. And then just let's go, let's go loud. And then starts the film... flossing in front of the fucking death angels. Like let's go, <laughs> got some fucking bad beats, and then poof, off screen, and then credits roll. Mm. I don't know. I I just I, I'm very conflicted about the end for that character, but also kudos to them for having the balls to make a disposable character their main character mm. i just thought that's a bit it's not the f- it's not the femme fatale or, or like scream queen or final girl that we're used to in fact it really flips the final girl formula our final girl i think i appreciate girl. them doing that particularly because it's a prequel like how many prequels have we seen where you're like no nah, it's a prequel so they have to die like that's how it works so the fact Rogue that they one, op- baby. right <laughs> the fact that they they bookend the film by yeah well they start it by saying she's terminally ill like there is there is a shelf life here that mm. she she will die whether it be by alien or by cancer it's unfortunately going to happen so i think I, I think it's pretty excellent that they had the balls to just tell you straight up hey, this character is not going to make it. So yeah. what you're witnessing is just how they survived the initial outbreak or the apocalypse or whatever, then they die. Obviously, Eric is the the character that you're left wondering, will they survive? And she kind of puts all of her efforts to make sure that happens. Um, but yeah, I thought, it was, I thought it was a really cool choice. I also have no issue with the ending. Um, on a, a, like, personally, I don't have an issue with it. Um, it definitely gives the sort of messaging of her going out her own way. Like she's in oh, control yeah, sure, yeah. of 
the end of her life mm. and she's not letting cancer do that for her. Um, and yeah, I don't need to see the character die. I don't like that. It's not one of those fade to black. Did they survive moments? No, she's fucked. She's dead. She's gone. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. There's, there's no question there, but I think it's, it's fine to be implied violence in, in that case. I don't think I need to see Lupita get yeeted by a death angel. Mm. Yeah, I think maybe I've been spoiled by too many kind of wanky indie horror films where if a character like that that has a death sentence is going to go out on their own terms, there's some kind of philosophical motive or a little bit of navel-gazing that leads into it. Nah, she's just fucking done. Yeah. She had her pizza. She visited the the jazz bar. Maybe that's the way to do it. Just, Mm. I I don't know. I'm, I'm a little bit conflicted on the end. I don't think it's bad. Make that clear. I think of all the endings that could have been, it's certainly not a bad ending. I'm um, just as uh, maybe I've been a bit spoiled with too much navel gazing for big climactic thinky finales, and this isn't that. This is yeah. You just gotta make your peace with the fact that your main character's been wiped at the end, and the yeah, our, our side character and Eric, who we don't know fucking much about, is just there because he's a human trying to survive. Off, off, off you go. What do you make of it, Zach? I mean, I thought it was fine. I thought it was yeah. neat, <clears throat> tight, kind of wrapped it up in a way yeah. like mm-hmm. like like people have died in this universe so you know someone who with her illness is probably not going to survive long so it, it was good that we uh had that in that powerful moment where you know she chose her own way not own way but yeah. you know, her yeah. own time yeah 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 look i think we can all agree it would have been disingenuous and and probably a bit of a slap to the audience to give her a, a shining victory at the end when we've spent yeah. the entire film being reminded of just how mortal she is mm-hmm. and the film does go great lengths um, we're, we're constantly reminded of the fact that uh, she she's got like pain uh, a, a pain relief uh, that she needs to attend to and stuff like that like like this is a character that without getting attacked is already in constant pain and agony and mm-hmm. suffering <laughs> probably needs to you know, be put out of that by the end of the film, which is an awful thing to say, but I think it yeah. probably makes us appreciate just how it closed out. Yeah. All right, cool. So this one was, uh, while well, we will just wrap it up, but this one was directed yeah. by Michael Sarnowski. I think that's how you say his name. And he also wrote the screenplay, uh, big with credit John... with, um, John Krasinski. So yeah, well, he, OG, yeah. So he, yeah, sorry. Yeah, he's, by... he's, he's, yeah. So oh, he, sorry. but, um, Big old Johnny K, he stepped away because he wanted to give. Uh, I, I, can't, I should have written it down, but I know he, he he wanted to give the prequel its own voice. If you, I'm I'm paraphrasing sure. basically, but that makes a lot of sense because uh, I was saying to April like it didn't. If you didn't have the Death Angels in there, it could have been any other apocalyptic thriller. It yeah. very much had the structure of one, other than our protagonist. I feel like buck the trend of those films, but. We, April and I did leave with a distinct feeling like this didn't seem like it was written at its heart to be a quiet place story, but became that. Mm. So maybe <clears throat> John not having central writing duties contributed to that. I don't know, but. Anyway. All right. Final, anyway. final thoughts and verdict. So Adam, what out of, if you had to score this bad boy out of 10, how many death angels are we given this one? <laughs> Um, I'd land somewhere in like the seven to eight range of death angels. Probably. I, I personally had a really good time with it. I enjoyed it a whole lot more than I was expecting from a prequel. I, I yeah, I really liked it. Sure. Nathan, where, where would you sit? Yeah, pro- probably look, I, I've now done a couple of these VHS casts, right. And I've kind of got a metric going of where I put certain films on the ranking and I'm pretty sure uh, Resident Evil, uh, Welcome to Raccoon City or whatever. I'm pretty sure I got that on like a six. So I have to give this at least a 6.5. Like yeah. this is better than that. No question, guys. Yeah. yeah. So I'm probably going to 6.5. Like, it's, it's definitely better. It's it's not bad. It's a bit, bit better than average for me. Yeah. I, I'd give it give it an eight. I reckon I, I did. I did really. Yeah, nice. That's quite like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I misread your reaction to that so big. I know. I, know. So I, know. I do too, man. Don't it'd be, stress. It'd be, I it'd assume be seven, that you fucking flubbed it. No, nah, it'd be 7.5 to an 8, but, you know, let's let's just tip it up to to an 8. Um, sure. We're yeah. feeling good. 
Yeah, I, I thought it was a uh, ticket. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Give the extra strong, five. strongly acted. You know, I thought I thought it was it was very very well acted, and it just it was no criticisms in the acting. Absolutely, yeah. No, yeah, two I mean, two main characters with very emotive faces as well. Like they, they had to they, carry it with their faces. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. A lot um, of a lot of lip reading. Yeah, and most of my criticisms or my main criticisms that yeah, criticisms are. Like the small things, like oh, they picked up the rules too quickly. Yeah, um, that's that's me too. It's just yeah. really fucking hair splitting shit. <laughs> Ten thousand people walking the street. What are they doing? Um, is this a quiet place or a loud place? Anyway, but um, yeah. So <gasps> I. Uh, all right, cool. Thank you once again to Paramount Pictures for letting us go see that. I don't know where that, what what the aggregate of that that is. It's probably about seven. That that's probably about where it lands, on the VHS scale well yeah we'll oh, suck sure. a big seven on it yeah very good yeah. um on rotten tomatoes it's got an 87 percent rating which um yeah, a oof. real strong reception fresh um, yeah all right Folks before we before That's we awesome. do before we leave very 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 quick question for you what do you, what do you reckon anna thought of it oh beautiful question too slow yeah i'm going with that too too slow mate it was bloody boring that's but that's yep. pretty much like yeah. Yeah. Slow, that checks boring. Out. Yeah. I, I think Anna me. needs to to come on to the the last five minutes of these podcasts to the, give her a quick wrap up. I think that's what the world really needs. Yeah. Uh, for the record, I think her reaction to that is perfectly valid and understandable because <laughs> I think April probably left with a similar thought. Mm. <laughs> that's fine. In, not not Can't her defense, but in in the in the film's defense. Anna's not a huge fan of the two films anyway. Like she, they're like they're fine. Yeah, right? like yeah. Stuff. Like she had no I, real desire to see it. Other no than connection. Dragging it to her. In fact, she tried to offhand um, the be like, "Can't you go with someone else?" <laughs> oh, Love it. Anyway, got us a couple. Anyway. Um, All right. Yeah, this this isn't going to be the film that changes your perception of a quiet place. This isn't going to be the third film in the series that fo- suddenly gets you in. Absolutely not. No, if you weren't loving it. You won't, you won't love it here, I don't think. Mm. And, and I guess the, the interesting thing is if you are wanting more, like, lore, I guess, or more uh, stuff, like, on the Death Angels or, you know, or whatever they're called, this is not the... The prequels is not the film to do that. Like, you know what I mean? And that's probably where I, you know, need to temper, my, like, my own things because, because, yes, I know about it, but you have to remember, like, as you said, the cast doesn't, right? So... Um, there is yeah. a disparity there. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, cool. Seven out of ten on the well played VHS scale. There. All right, thank that's you for listening. Uh, that's, that's on par with the Last of Us. Hell yeah! Of the well played VHS podcast, you can check it out on Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. Not sure where I was going with that one, but have a great weekend. And uh, boys, I, don't know, I recommend watching this on YouTube. I think we did really good on the visuals. Absolutely. Look we, at us. We did. Ash has done a smashing job best. with our new artwork. So leave a comment and uh, email us at artworks at wellplayed.com.au and we'll make sure Ash gets that feedback. All right, cool. We're going. Bye. Bye. Farewell. See you next time. <laughs>